What's up guys, it's Dom Matter here, and today we're going to be talking about the Ukraine-Russia uh, war and how it is going to affect global food prices. So here we have a pretty good map, um, it's a world map with it shows different uh, effects that this is going to have. So governments toppled by costs of living crisis, um, possibility out of Pakistan, uh, largest wheat buyers from the Ukraine. Um, obviously, we have Egypt, uh, Indonesia, uh, Bangladesh. Oh, Sri Lanka is also possibly topped by cost of living. Um, most at risk of famine. We have a couple countries in the Horn of Africa and then Nigeria. Main destinations for Russian fertilizer, the United States, Brazil, India, um, China, and I believe that is Estonia. It's hard to tell, but it looks like it's Estonia. Um, anyway, so obviously this is going to be a major issue uh, for a, bi a couple big reasons. So firstly is just the fact that Ukraine is one of the largest grain producing countries in the world. Um, they are, I believe, next to Russia, the largest grain producer in Europe, and with Western countries being at odds with Russia and Ukraine's production being largely shut down because of the war um grain is not going to be getting to a lot of western countries or western ally countries from russia now this is not entirely a big deal for countries like canada the united states um you know certain other western countries who have a you know large enough domestic production that they can support themselves um canada is one of the largest agricultural industries in the world despite having a small population so we really have no uh, need to import food other than, like, certain things that won't grow here if we want them. But most of those, to some degree, could be considered luxury goods, like a lot of fruits and a lot of stuff like that. Canada easily has enough, in terms of just raw calories, to support itself. The U.S., uh, same thing. The U.S. is actually in an uh, even better situation in some sense, although they do have a much larger population. Um, they do have a much more diverse uh, set of foods that they can grow within the country. Um, Canada largely has like two or three climate zones that are able to grow food, whereas the United States has pretty much any climate you can think of, um, from you know tropical areas like Florida to Mediterranean climates like California, um, you know warm and cold continental climates. Pretty much anything you can think of, the United States has the ability to grow. They have. Um, some territory that can grow that certain thing. Even like Hawaii can grow. I, I don't know if coconuts grow in the Pacific. I, I assume so. I think coconuts are from the Pacific. It's actually a good question. Where are coconuts originally from? Let's check this out. Coconuts. Oh, what the fruit. Or I guess is it? Uh, let's see, Wikipedia. Where are coconuts from? This is, you know, the, the important questions are getting asked here. Um, history, origin. Okay, so they originate in the Central Indo-Pacific, and they are pretty common across all of the Indo-Pacific. Okay, oh. And then Europeans brought them to the Caribbean, so they can also grow there too, which kind of makes sense. Um, anyway. But yeah, as I was saying, the United States pretty much has the option to grow any kind of food they want. Um, although they do have a very large population, they're able to support that population. Canada, obviously having a small population, uh, especially relative to the size of the country, can easily support itself. Western Europe can largely live off the back of Canada and the United States. Uh, when it comes to food production, they have a, a fair amount on their own, and then also we can produce food for them. Latin America, um, Brazil really being the agricultural dominant down there uh they have you know they're able to produce a lot of their own food um argentina as well a, a big uh food supplier um so the americas as a whole are pretty much going to be safe western europe's probably going to be able to supply uh a large chunk of its own food but we'll be able to get the rest from uh canada the united states eastern europe the nato allied countries will have access to western food um the big areas I think this is really going to affect is going to be Africa, the Middle East, 
Um, India and China will probably largely be unaffected because China is able to produce a lot of its own food, although they do need to import some. I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are on Chinese food imports. India, similar situation. They do have some of the most fertile land in the world. But both those countries being essentially neutral in the, uh, in the conflict, even though they are some of the main importers of Russian fertilizer, they are going to still be getting that fertilizer. Whereas the United States which and Brazil... Um, Brazil, it remains yet to be seen. I'm not actually sure uh, how hard of a stance Brazil has taken on Russia. I'll actually look into that right now. Yeah, so Brazil has also taken a neutral stance. So Brazil will be in a, in a relatively easy situation. The United States is going to be the big one that's affected by the fertilizer. Um, and obviously the uh, Baltic countries that get a lot of the fertilizer from there. But, again, these countries are going to be able to look for other options, and it will probably end up at least temporarily causing food prices to increase. But in the long run, um, a lot of this stuff ends up causing technological developments and other industries to pop up elsewhere that allow more fertilizer production in other areas so that they can compete. Um, and I think what you're going to see, especially in the West, is possibly... Something similar to how the empires of, you know, the early modern age, late, I guess you'd call it like the Renaissance age into the early modern age, you know, the Victorian era, whatever you want to call it, you know, kind of the like late 16, early 1700s, all the way up until like the early 1900s, where the empires basically had like internal economies, right? So Britain would almost exclusively trade with its colonial possessions, whether they be the white settler colonies um, the, you know, protectorates they had, such as uh, Botswana, um, you know, uh, true colonies in the sense of, like, you know, in India, almost all of the trade that the British were doing was with their colonies, or in act actually the United States as well. They did a lot of trade with the United States even after it separated. But most of the trade within most of the European powers was done within their internal trade system, right? Um and I think we might see something similar to that, where the U.S. kind of takes on, like, a head colonial role, for lack of a better term. And it obviously ha will have, you know, the, for the, the majority, if not all, of the Americas, um, maybe except for Cuba and Venezuela, within a sphere of influence. Although we may see them topple those governments in order to get them within their sphere of influence. Um, Western Europe, parts of Eastern Europe, all kind of fall into this new year... Uh, American-led trade zone. And we could see India is going to be one of the big interesting ones here. You know, with definitely I would imagine Japan, um, Australia, you know, being an Anglo country. Uh, Japan would fall into it. South Korea would fall into it. You know, for them it's geostrategically important to maintain a good relationship with the United States. Um, India will be the interesting one because India is trying to kind of build up a kind of a group of allies to kind of combat China because China is, they have territorial disputes with China, they don't really get along with China, and they've been, um, you know, really at each other's throats for the last couple of years. Uh, you know, things did kind of die down after they had their war back, and I believe it was the 60s or the 70s, they had a small war. Things died down for a little bit. They kind of just both, you know, agreed to disagree for a while there. And then things have kind of been heating up again as China has been getting more expansionistic and more aggressive over the past decade, decade and a half. And I think what you're going to see is China, or sorry, India, is going to have to make a decision. Are they going to stay neutral or are they going to fall into what is essentially, you know, that American dominated sphere? And it's going to be a tough decision for them because them being a formerly colonized country, um, they're not going to, you know, there's going to be a large resistance towards it, even though it's probably the most strategically beneficial thing for them. Um, India has been having a hard time really keeping up with the growth of China, despite having similar populations. India's actually population is growing at a faster rate than China's population is growing. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see what their populations end up being. Um, and 
you know, China is trying to turn that around with ending the one-child policy, turning into a two-child policy. I believe they actually took away the two-child policy. Now they're trying to get the birth rates as high as they can. Um, India, on the other hand, has been kind of going the other way. They've been kind of trying to slow the birth rate down a little bit, but despite that, they still have one of the highest birth rates in the world. Um, and I believe India is set to surpass China in population over the next decade or so. And but regardless of that, you know, the, these... You know, India is in a, in a tough situation when it comes to do they want to kind of, for lack of a better term, bend the knee to another Western power, although it would be a much better situation than they had under the British Raj, you know, with America not actually controlling them, them just kind of being in the American sphere of influence. Or, uh, excuse me, do they want to let China be an aggressive, much more powerful nation on their border? And that also depends, you know, can China maintain its... Uh, growth or even maintain its current power and not stagnate as the birth rate continues to decline despite efforts to turn it around um, and as they tighten up their economic uh, rules and you know the all this wealth and power they've gained from capitalism starts to fade away um, but yeah it'll all be interesting and I think you know this is going to cause probably one of the biggest crises of the next 10 15 years. We have, you know, obviously the massive economic crisis uh, throughout the world caused by a mix of different factors. You've had the rise of left-wing progressive politics um, really shattering a lot of the economies of Western countries, really damaging them. Um, you know, a lot of Western countries have been kind of living off the fumes of the Reagan era, uh, you know, the, where you had a lot of countries kind of fell in line with what the United States did. Right, you saw throughout the '80s and the '90s, a lot of uh, countries really re-liberalized their economies, recapitalized their economies after 20 or 30 years there of slowly drifting towards socialism. You know, there was this big pushback on you know what's called like the neoconservative, neoliberal movement that happened in the, you know from like the early to mid '80s all the way until like the mid 2000s, um, and then since then you've had like the past. 15, nearly 20 years now of another slow drift towards socialism in most of these countries. Um, so, some faster than others. For example, you know, me being from Canada, we had Harper, who is a kind of a somewhat between a neocon and a libertarian, kind of halfway between those two ideologies. And he was our prime minister until I believe it was 2015 was the election he lost. Um, or 2013. I think it was 2015. I can't remember. Anyway, when he, he, you know, he was very much like our, um, you know, another, you know, for us, that, that movement really started with Jean Chrétien. He was like a neoliberal who came out of the liberal party. Um, before that, the liberals were much more socialist. You know, they were very much dominated by, uh, you know, kind of the, the Pierre Trudeau and like his kind of henchmen, although Jean Chrétien also was one of those guys. But once Jean Chrétien took over, after his first couple of years, he became very much like a neoliberal kind of guy. Um, then you had Paul Martin, who was, you know, kind of the economic theorist behind all of Jean Chrétien's policies. He was also a neoliberal. Um, and then we ended up getting Harper, who was kind of like a neocon libertarian hybrid. And so we had a very liberalized capitalism focused economy for from like 1993 ish all the way until like 2015 ish and you saw Canada have some of the fastest economic growth in the world um some you know we were one of the few countries that made it through the 2008 financial crisis with little you know little problems relatively little problems and then we had obviously Trudeau who took power and within the last you know, seven years or whatever it's been. I think he, I can't remember if it was 2013, 2015 when he first took power, but seven to nine years, <clears throat> whenever he'd end up taking power, um, you've really seen, you know, he's been slowly drifting the economy to the left. He took out massive amounts of uh, debt in order to build up different, you know, infrastructure plans and, you know, give money to different countries and like a bunch of different stuff. You know, the Canadian debt has risen to an all time high. Uh, the economy is largely stagnated. We've had massive inflation. Uh, then COVID hit, which you know definitely didn't help. And then now you have the um, the Ukraine war, which is probably going to affect Canadians as well, just because it's going to affect some of our allies so much that inevitably it will affect us. So while it might not affect us, you know, directly as much as it'll affect the United States with their fertilizer, 
or you know the different European countries through the, you know the refugee waves and you know obviously them being so dependent on uh, Russian energy sector, it is going to affect us in the long term, uh, you know the medium term and the long term, and I think the world is largely kind of in a situation where it's heading for. Um, you know, a kind of economic economic meltdown, something the likes of which we probably haven't seen since possibly the Great Depression. I think it's going to be worse than the 08 recession, um, especially because, like, on top of what's all happening in the West right now and the f- food shortages because of Ukraine, you've also got, like, the Chinese housing bubble, which is going to collapse at any moment now. Um, not only within China do you have the housing bubble, which is probably the biggest issue in China, or one of the biggest issues in China. You've also got China having, you know, the slow crackdown on the capitalism within the country and them kind of turning towards a more hardline communist fascistic uh, version of uh, their country, kind of similar to, you know, slowly moving back towards, like, stuff that you would see under, like, Mao Zedong, although with, you know, much better technology now because they did have those capitalist years. Um, So it'll be really interesting to see, and unfortunately... Um, I think, you know, a lot of people are probably going to starve to death. And, you know, when when the going gets tough, you know, people got to harden up. And I think, you know, since World War II, we've had this really luxurious, luxurious society in the West. And it's kind of spilled over into other countries. And because of that, you know, countries have been largely friendly with each other. You know, I know a lot of people are going to find issues with me saying that, like, oh, we invaded this country, we invaded this country, we invaded this country. And it's like, yes, obviously those wars did happen, but if, you know, uh, if you look at, like, wars per, you know, per capita or whatever you want to call you know, wars per year, it's a lot less than it used to be prior to World War II. Like, major countries used to go to war with each other all the time. Um, major countries used to pick on smaller countries all the time. Nowadays, you know, there's maybe two or three conflicts going on at any given time. And most of them are kind of, you know, long, drawn-out guerrilla warfare conflicts. You know, like, the U.S. has been, you know, the the dominant superpower for, uh, you know, since the end of the Cold War, you know, 1990-ish, you know, 89, 90, 91, kind of, you know, in that era where, like, the Soviet Union started to crumble. And... You know, they, they were basically the sole superpower for the majority of that time. You know, China's kind of rising. You know, maybe you could consider them a superpower now, although, you know, they still have problems maintaining regional, um, you know, power. That You know, they have Taiwan right off the coast of their country, and they can't hold it because the United States is willing to defend it. So, um, but, you know, the U.S. in that time period has only invaded a handful of countries, which sounds like a lot until you, like, look historically at how much wars and conflicts did happen in tougher times. You know, the luxury of luxury is that as, you know, there's more to go around, people get less aggressive for the little amount that they have. And I think, unfortunately, we might be coming to an end to that. And we might have just, you know, we might be seeing the end of a kind of golden era of human prosperity and of uh, compassion and, you know, just lack of war, you know, despite how bad people think it is who have nothing else to compare it to. If you look at the historical context, this has been a relatively peace, peaceful time. There's a reason it's called the Pax Americana, um, you know, with the, you know, basically with the exception of like the Pax Britannica and the Pax Romana um, and the Pax Romana being, you know, more specific to Europe, whereas um, Britannica and Americana more global, um, you know, this is probably the most peaceful time in, in the history of the world, and it's probably going to be coming to an end. Um, and I think this, you know, this is just the start of it. So like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think below. Um, how much do you think this is going to affect your country? Do you think, you know, are you one of the countries that's going to be mostly affected by this food uh, shortage, or you, is your country going to be fine? Um, how aggressive do you think other countries are going to get over the next couple of years now that this situation has kind of expanded into, um, you know, food shortages, which is going to have ripple effects throughout all different countries. Uh, Yeah, just kind of let me know. See you later, guys. Have a good one.